All right, Merry Christmas. I'm so excited, man. Christmas is so close. Uh, but you know, there's all kinds of surprises when you start planning stuff fam- with family. Anybody had interruptions to their plans yet? Anybody extra coming from din- for dinner that you didn't plan for? Or you gotta run out and buy an extra gift for somebody? Like there's, life is full of interruptions, especially when you start mixing families and plans. I, I mean, my whole week has been like that. And I don't necessarily love interruptions in my plans, right? My wife, earlier this year, she had something just kind of interrupt her day. She was at the park with a bunch of her mom friends. And uh, this guy runs up and he's like one of these long distance runners, got on tight, you know, tight clothes. Looks like he should have a bike, but there's no bike. And it's just weird. He runs right up to Rebecca and he's like, I need water. You know, she's like, why don't you bring water? You know, my wife's not afraid sometimes to be like, well, where's your water? And, she, you know, he's ran and then she, she's like, well, how far did you run? He's like, I ran eight miles from my house. I got to run eight miles back. And she's like, we well, don't just need water. You need a cell phone because you're going to die. You got a cell phone? No. Uh, do you have goo? Like you need the runner's goo. And every good runner knows you got to have the goo. My, my wife runs, you know, marathons and Ragnar. And she, he's like, what's the goo? And it's like, it's got sugars and all this stuff. You don't have the runner's goo? Like, what are you doing? You know, and she's, now he, she starts digging her purse. Now the smart thing this guy did is he ran to a mom. If you're ever in trouble, go to a mom, okay? Because mom's got all kinds of stuff, you know? They're like that Harry Potter girl with the purse, just pulling out everything. That purse isn't even magic. That's just, she just stole it from a mom, all right? And so my wife starts digging. She has a protein bar. He's like, I'm gluten-free. You're like, you know, she rolls her eyes. And uh, she had, we have two boys. She has two juice boxes. And he's like, oh, thanks. And then he's standing there. You know, the other moms have like backed away. You know, it's a bad sign when moms grab their kids and back like three feet away from this weirdo. He's sitting there sipping this juice box, which is super awkward. A grown man drinking a juice box, drinks both of them, throws them, you know, bounces off like, thanks. And her mom friends come back. They're like, okay, that was so weird. You know, what, what stranger comes up and takes your juice boxes from your kids? And my wife's like, oh, it's... It's not weird if you know it. So his name is Matt Brown, and he's a pastor of our church, and he does stuff like that all the time. She said, I was surprised he was wearing shoes. Oh, we love Matt, right? But you don't like to run into him. He's got horrible timing. You know what I'm saying? You see him at the groceries. I know how you guys are, man. You love our pastor, but you see him at the grocery store and you get all nervous. You're like, what am I wearing? What am I buying? You know, like <laughs> people get all scared because he's, he's, his timing is horrible. You know, he shows up when you're not expecting and that, it messes with your plans. And I think a lot of, I man, life with Jesus is kind of like that. Like we love Jesus. We just don't like his timing. You know, we, we want to hear from Jesus. We want to hear from God. But listen, Jesus is a party crasher, okay? He, he will show up and interrupt everything that's going on. And, and that's what he's like. His timing is always, is, is always off, it seems like. Now, we look at the Christmas story. Even his birth, man, the timing, he gets it all wrong. He shows up in the middle of all this chaos, this census, all this stuff. They're late to Bethlehem. Everything about this story goes wrong. You know, right before we get, you know, headed into Christmas, I don't know how your plans are going to go Christmas Day. I hope they go well. But even if they all get messed up, it's not as bad as the first Christmas. The first Christmas was a train wreck, all right? We're going to look, our our vision here is to be real. We're going to read chapter two and just be real about how horrible this event was for this family. I mean, the Hebrew for the title of this chapter should just be, this is a hot mess, all right? Luke 2, it's a hot mess. It says, in those days, if you got your notes, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. Oh, great. And all went to be registered in his own town. And Joseph also went from Galilee, a town of Nazareth, all the way down to Judea, a city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. Already his family has just been displaced by this government decree. So all of a sudden the government says it, everybody's got to go, everybody's moving, everybody's going into Bethlehem. So, you know, his plans are totally interrupted. This wasn't in the plan, right? Especially when you're with Mary. He says he makes this journey to be registered with Mary, his teen pregnant, basically fiance. Okay, read this. Mary, his betrothed. You know what that means? Eh, Are they married? Eh, Not quite yet. Is she pregnant? Definitely. Right? That's weird. I mean, at one point, Joseph's like, 
what, you know, he doesn't know whether to call Mari Povich or break it off, you know, like whose baby is this? And their, their relationship is, is kind of on the rocks. God has to intervene to keep them together. But he's making this trip with his pregnant fiance is super awkward and it's kind of shameful, you know, it's dishonoring. And the trip itself would have been brutal. I mean, imagine doing that pregnant. It's like walking to San Diego. You know, it's like the Amazing Race teen mom, you know, MTV version. You know, and they lose. You know, the last team to Bethlehem loses. Well, they lose the race. It says while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes. And just like every new mom dreams of, lays him in a barn. In a manger. There's no Pinterest ideas for the manger. You with me? Lays him in a feeding trough. That's what a manger is in a barn. Because there was no place for them. Their timing was off. Everything about this story was wrong. And even for the, the innkeeper, whoever hosted them, we've been talking about th- that side of the door. Imagine getting a knock late at night and there's this teenage couple, she's obviously pregnant. And, and, and what a surprise that is. You, you know, we didn't plan for you. And, and this is what I love about Middle East culture. The hospitality says, we're gonna find something to do for you. And this family, this innkeeper, whoever it was, blesses them with at least a barn, at least a manger. It's not a great gift, but it's something. It's not a great gift, but he doesn't turn them away. And he says, you can have the manger. And what's awesome is God says, I can work with that. I can make Christmas out of that. But the rest of this story is a mess. The only thing perfect at Christmas time is Jesus. But the rest of it's a hot mess. I want you to write this down. Advent starts with an adventure. Now, adventure is a nice way to say it. You might say that was a nightmare, all right? Some of us don't, we don't like adventures. Any of you guys planners? You like to plan? I'm like Bilbo Baggins. When you say adventure, I think adventures make you late for dinner, all right? And I don't like adventures. I'm trying to be more spontaneous. I realize that some of my greatest moments of blessing others are ministry moments though happen when all my plans get messed up and God interrupts. And so I'm trying to listen to God more. One of the a mentor of mine said to me one time, Claude, life's interruptions are God's invitations. You, you need to make space when you get interrupted and listen for what God's doing. Earlier this year, I got this message. It was an invitation to come to this event, this action sports event in France, but it said it's in two weeks. Can you make time to come? And I was like, I looked at my schedule. I'm like, I'm gonna move with this because that's my best opportunity to hang out with some of my lost friends that don't know Jesus. One in particular is my friend from New York and God has just put him on my heart for the last couple of years. I don't know why, I love him. He's so close to Jesus. I know he's gonna be at this event, so I go and we're, we're messaging each other, but the whole four days, uh, you know, we just couldn't connect. Like he's busy with his stuff, I'm busy with my stuff. And we're just, it's not happening. I'm like, Lord, why am I here? Actually one night, they did text me to hang out. It was three in the morning, they're out partying. And I look on social media because I'm smart and I'm like, are they having a bonfire in the woods? That looks fun. And I look and I was like, that's, no, that's a parking lot. And that's not a bonfire, that's a car on fire. I was like, nope, you know, stupid and God, stupid tries to sound like God a lot. So you got to know the difference between stupid and God. And I was like, that's stupid. So I went back to sleep. But the fourth day came around. I'm like, I haven't hung out with him. I woke up and it rained and it rained out the event for the whole day and everything was canceled. I was sitting in the hotel lobby and I, my flight was later that day. I was sitting in the hotel lobby sleeping and I had my phone like this and my friend from New York texts me and says, are you ready to hang out? And I look up and he's sitting in the chair right in front of me. And he's like, let's go. I wanna show you something in the middle of the city, Montpellier, I wanna show it to you. And I was like, okay, let's go. So I, I, yeah, I turned my brain off, the fact that my flight leaves in like six hours. Turn my brain off, I'm like, God, you're doing something. Like, I'm, I wanna move with God, what are you doing right now? And as we make our way through the city, he's literally on his phone turning left and right down these streets in France, trying to find wherever he's navigating us to. And I'm like, what is going on? What are you doing? I'm starting to feel like, man, this is, how do I bring up spiritual things? Like, how do I not force it, but how do I bring up God? If I'm gonna miss my flight, I'm at least gonna talk about Jesus, you know what I'm saying? Like, and I'm starting to be like, man, this is a, this is a waste. How, I'm, this is never gonna happen. We turn this corner. And he does this, he's like so proud. And there's this huge like stained glass cathedral church. And he's so proud, he knows that he's like, you, you like this, right? <laughs> like God lives there or something, you know? <laughs> I'm like, you know, God doesn't live there. It actually led to, he led me into the best spiritual conversation I've ever had with him. And when I, I, I left thinking, you know what God, you're a better guide, you're better at guiding than I'm at, I am at planning. It, but I need to learn to listen 
to God's voice. That's what we're talking about. You know, we've talked about how do we bless people. We've talked about who are the kind of people God is calling us to bless, but we haven't talked about yet is the moments where we hear God's voice and where God says to you, I want you to move. I wanna interrupt your plans to bless this person. Isaiah 30 says it like this. Whether you turn to the right or the left, God, God's the one navigating you somewhere if you let him. God's the one taking you somewhere good. Whether you turn to the right or the left, you will hear, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk into it. You know, if I could teach you one thing that would change your life, that would change your walk with Jesus, it's learning to listen to God and obey him. Learning to listen to his spirit. And, and, and I know God speaks because I've heard it. I've seen it happen in my life. The living God will speak to you if you learn to listen to him. And, and you need to read the scripture so that you know the difference between the voice of stupid and the voice of God. The, the scripture gives you everything you need. It gives you all the instructions for life and godliness and wisdom. It gives you stories. If, if the scripture was an instruction book for sailing a boat, it would tell you everything about how to sail. It would tell you everything about how to steer, how to raise the sails, how, how to you know, do everything, how to launch. It would give you stories of people who didn't do it and drowned it. it you know, it would give you stories of people who did it right and saved others. It, it, it's everything you need for sailing, but it's not the wind. The Bible doesn't give you the wind, the moments. Only the Holy Spirit can speak that to you. And that's what we need to do is learn to listen to God's Spirit. Most of the time in my life when God, I feel Him speaking to my heart, it's to move me into opportunities to bless others and to have some kind of ministry that opens doors for others. One of my friends is a missionary in Southeast Asia uh, in a dangerous country. In fact, uh, right before he moved his family there, there was a family that was killed uh, in that country, but he decided to move there anyway. When they did, one of the men in the village uh, realized you know, that he's there as a Christian and, and became one of the chief persecutors of my friend and his family, told other people not to talk to them, and, and, and just was an antagonist for their ministry the whole first year. And one day my friend Jesse, uh, he said this man came to his door and knocked at his door. And when he opened it, he was carrying his son. His son had fell into a rice grinder. There's blood everywhere. And, and he said he needed to go to the hospital. And my missionary friend had the car. So he said, put him in the car. And they drove two hours to the hospital with this kid. And he's praying the whole time, God, spare his life. Spare this kid's life. Spare this kid's life. They get to the hospital, the kid lives. But what happened in that community afterward, as people saw how my friend Jesse blessed that man, even though he was an enemy, even though he opposed them, the whole community, they, they changed. In fact, that man came back to his home a month later, knocked on his door and said a word in their language that means my family, we are indebted to you forever. This is why we need to bless people. Write this down. Because blessing opens the door for Jesus. Our blessing, the reason why we're talking about blessing Riverside and our community and the Inland Empire is it opens the door for the gospel. It opens the door for Jesus. Colossians 4 says this, devote yourselves to prayer. And then I want you to underline this, being watchful. This is what we're talking about. Being watchful, listening, raising the sails. You know, every morning saying, God, I'm gonna read your word, I'm gonna raise the sails, but I'm gonna I have to listen for your wind. I'm gonna have to listen for your voice and your spirit to move me and be thankful. He said, God, uh, Paul says, pray for us that God may open a door for what? For our message so that we may, may proclaim the mystery of Christ. Listen, the best gift you have to give away is the gospel, is Jesus. Be wise therefore in the way that you act toward outsiders, the way you bless those that are unseen and make the most of every opportunity. You know what I love about this innkeeper, whoever it was, is he sees outsiders as someone to bless. He sees this opportunity and he makes the most of what he has, doesn't he? He says, we have no room in the guest room, we have no room in our house, but I'm gonna make the most of what I can give. I'm gonna make the most of what I have to give to you. We have a barn. It's not a great gift, but it's something. It's a manger. It's not, a, it's not clean. It's, it's, 
It's not the Nick you, right? But it's something and God says, I can work with that. Can you imagine a day in the future if that person ever found out that they hosted the Messiah? Can you imagine that? And I don't know if that will ever happen, but I'm just saying, imagine a day in the future where someone comes and goes, man, this is where the, this is where the king stayed. The king of kings slept here. He's gonna go, no, he didn't. We, we've never hosted a king. We don't even have a king-sized bed. How can we host a king? You know, that doesn't really make sense. They go, no, you remember the couple that you put in the barn. When you opened that door, that was Jesus at the door. You didn't see it, but it was Jesus that you hosted. You know, Jesus actually tells a parable that's exactly like this, that those are the kind of people that God rewards in heaven, the people that have that kind of heart to bless outsiders, make the most of those opportunities. Look at what he says in Matthew 25. The king is gonna say to those he, he rewards on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me a juice box to drink, kept me alive, praise God. I was a stranger at the door and you invited me in. You don't think Jesus maybe rec you know, recalls his own birth where a stranger took Joseph and Mary in? I needed clothes, you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison, you came to visit me. And what I love is the righteous, they, they, they said, when did we do that? You know, they're not trying to earn points with God. They're not trying to earn, like their acts of service and their acts of blessing, they're, they're not trying to be religious. They don't, even, they don't even know what you're talking about. They're, when do we do that? Lord, when do we see you hungry and feed you? When do we see you thirsty and give you something to drink? When do we see you as stranger and invite you in or with clothes and clothes you? Where do we see you sick and in prison and go visit you? And the king is gonna reply, truly I say to you, whenever you did it for the least of these, brothers and sisters of mine, it was Jesus at the door. It was God saying, I was there. When you blessed that person, I was there. It was Jesus at the door. Can you imagine a time in your future where you look back on your life and say, and God says, man, you remember when you did that? I was in that moment. You blessed Jesus when you did that. Now, how do you know the difference between God's voice and other voices? This is what my son asked me this week. We had this great conversation. God, how, or he's like, Dad, how do I know it when it's God and not stupid, right? That's a good question. How do I know when it's God? And here's the deal. I can't be there with you to tell you and tap you on the shoulder and go, this is it. This is the, this is the spirit. This is the wind that you've been waiting for. I can't, Pastor Matt can't be there and, and tell you what to do and when to do it. But I can tell you what it feels like. Out, out of experience, I can tell you what it feels like when Jesus is calling us to do something. And so I want you to write these things down. I wrote down three moments that it's Jesus asking us to bless others. And the first one is this, when I least want to. <laughs> That's what makes it fun. When you don't want to at all, man. My wife, uh, she loves this author, uh, Beth Moore. Any ladies ever heard Beth Moore? She's an author, speaker, incredible. She's from Texas, got this like sassy Southern Texas accent. And, and one time she was flying home from some event. She was going through North Carolina and the airport was just packed with people. And, and they wheeled this old man in a wheelchair behind her. And she feels all these eyes staring at this old man because he's just such a strange sight. Said he had hair, you know, he's bent over and his hair was long and matted, like down to here, his fingernails grown out, just so odd to look at. And she looks over at him and she begins to look at this man. Said, she said, Jesus started, like God started talking to her heart. Like she felt Jesus speaking to her. And she said, Jesus no, I do not want to go talk to that man. I'm, I, do, I am not going to witness to that man, Jesus. Not here, not in this airport. No, no, Jesus, no. And uh, she said, God said, I don't want you to witness to him. I want you to brush his hair. She said, Jesus, God, I am your witness. I will witness to him. I'll share Jesus. He doesn't need a makeover, Jesus. He needs, he needs Jesus. He, what good is it if he goes to hell? If his, you know? And God's like, I want you to brush his hair. She goes over and she has to be like, sir, may I brush your hair? And he's so old, she has to yell, you know, in the middle of the airport, may I brush your hair? And everybody's just staring and she starts to brush his hair. She has to start like at the tips because it's so matted. She starts to brush this man's hair and while she's doing it, he starts to talk to her and he says, thank you. He goes, I'm headed home today to see my bride. 
He says, we've been married 60 something years and I'm headed home. I've been in the hospital almost a year and I just, I'm so embarrassed. I thought I'm, I'm, how awful I must look right now when I get home to see my bride. He calls her his bride. And I thought how awful I must look and then God sent you to brush my hair. The lady wheels him on the plane and she's just weeping. The lady comes back and is like, why did you do that? She comes straight to Beth Moore. She's like, who told you to do that? And she said, you know, like she said, why did you want to brush his hair? And Beth Moore said, I, honey, I didn't want to brush his hair. <laughs> She said, Jesus told me to, and he's the bossiest thing. (laughs) Galatians 5 says this, walk by the spirit and you won't do the things of the flesh. You won't gratify the desires of the flesh. I want you to circle the word flesh because this is a word that's confusing. It doesn't mean your body. The way Paul uses this word is to talk about sin, but not like I went to Vegas kind of sin. That's one way this is sin. But the other way he uses this word flesh is it means your self-reliance, your dependence on yourself to do things apart from God. And sometimes that can be religion. You wonder why religious people do lots of great acts? It's because they're trying to earn heaven apart from God. That's the flesh too. Both sin in Vegas and trying to do good. The, 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 The kind of blessing we're talking about doesn't earn you points in heaven. That can, be the, that can be the flesh too. The spirit is pulling you to do things where you get nothing in return and you don't need to earn points. But the spirit, the desires of the flesh are against the spirit. The desires of the spirit against the flesh, they're opposed to each other to keep you from doing, not just sin, but what does it say? To keep you from doing what you want to do. Listen to me. When you wanna be a, a, a taker, like one of the most spiritual things that you can do is when you wanna be a taker, to turn around and be a giver. Like one of the most spiritual things you can do is when when there's a long line and a short line to get in the long line and learn patience. One of the most spiritual things you can do is like when you you wanna be seen is do something in secret. When you wanna be praised to give away praise and honor. When when you wanna win to throw the game and lose because the flesh cries against that stuff. It kills the flesh, it kills sin in us and it teaches us to listen to the Holy Spirit. You ever seen kids try to lose, you you ever get big brother try to lose a race to little brother? It ain't gonna happen. I've been trying for years, I'm like please, okay, please just lose one race to your little brother for the love of our family. He can't do it, man, like last five feet, you know? Because the flesh cries against it, but it's good for your spirit. The reason we hate losing and we hate those things is we get nothing out of it. That's another way that you know God might be speaking to you is number two, when I get nothing in return. When you're gonna bless someone and you know it's Jesus speaking to you, it's probably you get nothing in return in it, not even to look cool and spiritual. (laughs) Psalms 37 says this, the wicked, we all know people like this, the wicked borrow and they don't repay you, do they? You may have a roommate like that, neighbors like that. See, nobody's raising a hand, guess what? You might be the neighbor. You need to take that stuff back, all right? Get convicted. But the righteous men just keep giving. You know what I've learned? It's just, it's okay to lose. It's okay to let somebody borrow something and just go, I'm just, I'm just gonna lose. It's okay to let stuff go, I'll buy another one. You with me? It's good for my heart to just lose sometimes. Uh, I mean, think, Christmas Day, you don't think that's a losing scenario for you parents? You ain't getting, it ain't 50 50, is it? How much, I, I, who knows how much you're spending on your kids in a couple of days? They're not gonna give you anything back. They're gonna write you a Christmas card on like a used paper towel <laughs> with a French fry and ketchup. They're just gonna write their name. They're not gonna write, love you, nothing. That's all you get back. But you love them and you bless, and you don't care about getting anything in return. Jesus said this, Luke 14, when you throw a dinner, don't invite your friends. Don't do it to get something back or your brothers, your sisters, your relatives. Don't invite your rich neighbor. If you do, they might invite you back and so you'll be repaid. But when you give a dinner or banquet, invite the poor. It's so counterintuitive, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. And although they can't repay you, look who's gonna repay you. 
God will repay you at the resurrection. It's just in the future. You know what I see happen at Christmas time? When parents get a really good gift, you know, when you spend, when you get like the gift they really want, you know what parents will do? They hide it for the end, don't they? It's a surprise. It's like, where's that BB gun, you know, for that kid? Uh, what's that behind the piano? Oh, <laughs> kid's all grumpy. Yeah, you gotta be careful because it'll backfire on you. I've seen it backfire. We had Christmas one year and cousin Dana, she wanted this bike. We opened all the presents, no bike. She lost her mind, all right? She went ballistic on her parents. And then her dad comes in wheeling from the kitchen, comes in wheeling the bike. And she's like, Bruh! right? And that's how, man, we get like that. In this life, we go, where's my, God, where is it? Where's my, where's my gift? Where's this thing? Where's my blessing back? And God's like, I, I didn't forget about you. Right, like, I didn't forget about you. God just saves the best gifts for the end, for the future. Be patient, wait for it. Now, a lot of us, when we think of what do we have to give, it seems inadequate. And if you think about a lot of the, a lot of the gifts that people gave Jesus, they didn't seem like they were the right gift to meet the need. We need to feed 5,000 people. Well, here's two fish, right? That seems unfit. But Jesus is like, I can work with that. That's what's crazy. Here's, here's water. We need wine, but here's water. I, I'll work with that. We need a place to stay, but here's a barn. Here's a manger. And God, the, the miracle is that God says, I can work with that. But when you don't understand how your gift is gonna do what God needs it to do, that's another sign that it's Jesus asking you to give it. I want you to write this down. When my gift seems unfit, and maybe even you feel like I am unfit. The Apostle Paul struggled with weakness and, and, and some suffering that he didn't understand. And, and even the Apostle Paul said, God, take this away. I don't understand this weakness in me. And he prayed to God and God answered him. And this is what he says. Each time God would answer me. He said, my grace is all you need and my power works best when it's misfit when it's weak. So Paul says, so I'm glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ can work through me. Sometimes when, man, when we don't see how it's gonna work is the time that God likes to show off and do only what God can do with it. One of the most unfit gifts in this whole Christmas story is the manger that we've been talking about. It's not the NICU. It's not even an appropriate place for a newborn. It's a feeding trough. It's unclean. You with me? It's unfit. It's, it's not right for the king. It's not right for any baby, let alone the king of kings or the Messiah. But here's why it's perfect. Because how else are you gonna find the Messiah in Bethlehem? When the angels appear to the shepherds, they say, great news. The Messiah has been born. The son of God has been born this day. He's in Bethlehem. Where are we gonna find him? Which baby? Right, everybody's in Bethlehem. Because of the census, every family's in Bethlehem. There's, 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 which baby are we looking for? Oh, that's the good part. It's the only baby you'll find in a barn. What baby are we looking for? The only baby you'll find in a feeding trough. The only baby you'll find in an unclean, is he, is he in a cathedral? No, he's in a manger. What, what, the impossible location of Jesus is what makes him impossible to miss. You with me? Like, like what distinguishes Jesus from, from every other baby in Bethlehem is that his location was unfit, unclean, unexpected. Now listen to me. What distinguishes Jesus and Christianity from every world religion is that God's location is unexpected. It's inside you. When religion says you gotta clean up when religion says you gotta look like a cathedral, God looked at you and me and he said, no, I can work with that. And you are the manger for the son of God in the world. Amen? You're the manger. The only thing perfect at Christmas is Jesus. Now the Christmas story, it's, it's not over. What's beautiful is God is still telling this story. You with me? We get to celebrate the beginning of Jesus' story this week, 
but the ending of the story hasn't happened yet and there's still a part for you. Just like the innkeeper had to answer the door and had to step into this moment, I believe God is inviting us to step into a moment. My son came home a couple months ago from school and he said, Dad, I wanna be in this play that our school is doing, it's Beauty and the Beast. I wanna try out for a part in the play. I was like, man, go for it. And our son loves to sing. It's a musical. He loves to sing. He's just like any 10, 11 year old. Man, he sings in the shower, sings while he's eating. He's like, hmm, 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 hmm. you know, we can't get him to stop singing. And when that stupid movie, Greatest Showman, came out, like we got lost our mind, you know, we just sang all those songs. He loves to sing. So I'm like, dude, go for it, man. Like, I love when he tries things and says yes. So he tries out, he comes home, he's like, I got this part, it's Maurice. You know, the, the dad, the old man, he gets the part of Maurice, brings the script home. My wife and I were looking through like what, you know, his part in the, in the play, what lines he has. My wife said, come in the kitchen. And she's looking through the script and she's like, babe, he's, he's got the part of Maurice, but Maurice is the only character in the play that has no song to sing. Sings no songs in the whole story. And I was, you know, as a dad, you're devastated. And, and I was also kind of frustrated. I'm like, why did they give him this part? We, bring, we sit him down on the couch. We're like, son, we're so proud of you. You know, we're so proud of you. You're Maurice, but, but there's no songs. Like you sing no songs. He goes, yeah, I know. And I said, what do you mean? And he goes, yeah, I know. I, and I said, why did you pick Maurice? And he said, dad, when they put the sheet up, every other character had names next to it. Kids had signed up for every other character. He said, Maurice, only character with no names next to it. He said, I just wanna be in the story. You know who God puts in his story? People who don't care if they get anything in return. People who don't care if they get to sing their song. People who don't care if they see how it fits. But people that say yes. When God invites them into the story, they say yes to bless. That's the people that God puts in his story. Listen to me. I believe God's gonna turn a page. There's gonna be a moment for our church, a, a, a knock at the door for you on Christmas Eve. And here's the deal, it's a surprise. I don't even know what's on the other side of the door. But I believe it's gonna be a blessing to our world to find out what's on the other side of the door you're gonna have to be here Christmas Eve. Let's pray. God, the story's not over. It's a, it's a cliffhanger because you're waiting on us. You're inviting us to step into the story. There's still so much joy to bring to the world. But what I, what's amazing and what I love is that you chose to put your power and your blessing into the most unlikely vessel imaginable us. Yeah, we were misfit, we weren't clean, but God, you looked at us and said, I can make a miracle out of those people. And God, if you can take the manger and, and make the Christmas story out of it, surely you can make a great story out of us. And so God, help us to hear your voice when you speak. Help us to listen and, and as you invite us into the adventure of blessing our world. God, help us remember the only thing perfect this Christmas is Jesus. But if Jesus is all we have, God, we have everything. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. Love you guys.